Hey, what's up guys? And welcome back to iGCSE Success, your one-stop shop for everything iGCSE English. And my first video on this channel looking specifically at the literature course. And in today's video, I am going to be looking at the poem Wind by Ted Hughes, published in 1957. And this, of course, will be the first video of 15 because there are 15 poems that you need to know inside out. I can't do it. You can! Come. You can do it! You can! So in this video, I am going to be breaking down the entire poem, looking at the language, the structure, the theme, the tone, all of the juicy bits, and everything you guys need to know to succeed with your poetry and prose exam. And with all that said and done, let's get on with today's video. So what is wind essentially about. So if we're just looking at the surface meaning of the poem, wind depicts the sheer ferocity of the wind or the storm and its unwavering mission to wreak havoc on the landscape and a very vulnerable, fragile house. And this wind is harsh, unforgiving, brutal, and it seems like it will do anything to uproot this house with people inside. However, like all good poems, the wind, of course, is a metaphor, a symbol, a vehicle to express a number of themes and ideas. You didn't just think it was a poem about wind, right? The natural world can be a scary thing, violent, brutal, destructive, and often when we least expect it. And well, when faced with such immeasurable and terrifying power, we are invariably left in a very precarious and futile position, often hoping for the best. Oh, and of course, there's conflict, internal conflict of sorts towards the latter part of the poem. And whilst the wind is battering this poor house, I guess Hughes' way of warning people not to allow arguments to escalate to such an extent that you forget to do the sensible thing like trying to save your life. So, um, pretty bleak and miserable. Ready to unpick the language? Let's go. Oh my goodness, before I start the second part of the video, the you know, the important bit, I have gone down every avenue trying to think of the best way to film this section. I started with the idea of annotating live with my tablet. I was recording the screen while simultaneously recording the audio separately. I think I was using Audacity, so a separate program. And then I realized that A, my handwriting is terribly messy, and B, I just had trouble trying to sync everything together. And uh, I was slowly syncing. I then tried the traditional PowerPoint route, and I just found there wasn't enough space to write what I wanted. And yes, at this point, I was close to giving up. It is a Sunday, you know, day off rest. But alas, Google Docs to the rescue. And I completely forgot that it's so much easier to annotate and add notes. So do let me know what you think. Enough waffling. Let's take a read of the poem. Ted Hughes, Wind. This house has been far out at sea all night. The woods crashing through darkness, the booming hills... Wind stampeding the fields under the window, floundering black astride and blinding wet. Till day rose, then under an orange sky, the hills had new places, and wind wielded blade light, luminous black and emerald, flexing like the lens of a mad eye. At noon I scaled along the house as far as the call house door. Once I looked up through the brunt wind that dented the balls of my eyes, the tent of the hills drummed and strained its guy rope. The fields quivering, the skyline a grimace, at any second to bang and vanish with a flap. The wind flung a magpie away, and a black bat gull bent like an iron bar slowly. The house rang like some fine green goblet in the note that any second would shatter it. Now deep in chairs in front of a great fire, we grip our hearts and cannot entertain book, thought, or each other. We watch the fire blazing and feel the roots of the house move, but sit on, seeing the window tremble to come in, hearing the stones cry out, 
under the horizon. So we have to start by looking at that striking opening metaphor. This house has been far out at sea all night. And this very much is a conscious choice. And when we talk about structure, we need to think about how the poet or writer has organize their ideas so if you're wanting those top marks you have to think about how a poem begins and how it progresses and how it ends and with this opening the metaphor is very much reminiscent of a ship struggling to navigate stormy waters now this house uh, initially is very much the center of the action it's in a precarious or dangerous situation it's unstable and this man-made structure really is no match for this ferocious storm that seems to be brewing outside it's wreaking havoc on the landscape it's distorting the landscape this is just a sign of things to come and this metaphor is very much emphasizing the house's fragility vulnerability and isolation think about a ship navigating these stormy waters it's helpless it's got no one to turn to and of course the storm the wind it's inescapable it's everywhere and mankind if you wanted to bring in some sort of discussion about uh, a central theme you could look at how mankind is futile insignificant powerless when facing such a terrifying ravaging storm a brilliant opening metaphor it's chilling it's foreboding it's ominous i love it now the second line, the woods crashing through darkness and booming hills, of course we've got auditory imagery here or onomatopoeia. Here we've got all of the elements coming together. We've got rain, we've got wind, we've got thunder. So not only is this scene visually threatening and terrifying, but also orally. The sounds are absolutely terrifying. And of course, there's this real sense of the landscape being brutally attacked by the wind, by the storm. There's this immeasurable power that the wind has. And it only has one goal. And of course, that goal is to cause as much destruction as possible. There's absolutely no hope for the landscape or house. And of course, there's this sense of foreboding from the onset. What I said before was this is just a sign of things to come. There's this real sense that the intensity, the ferocity of the wind is only going to intensify as the poem progresses. Now looking at the third line, wind stampeding the fields under the window. So you've got this brilliant verb here. Very, very interesting, very, very evocative, very unusual as well and it seems to zoomorphize the wind likening its behavior to a chaotic disorientated herd of animals and you would expect that with all of this chaos with all of this destruction unfolding outside and of course it's very much on ex an explicit level um, referring to the wind's velocity the speed it's so strong that at this point the windows are rattling the wind is battering against the glass of course glass is fragile we're thinking as a reader how long will these windows last and what i find quite interesting as a kind of structural choice that hughes has made is that there's this sense macabre sense this sinister sense of the the storm almost playing with the house at this point and the people inside they're tormenting uh, the storm is tormenting them this is maybe a warning of sorts and again for the third time linking back to what i said before this is just a sign of things to come and we fully anticipate the storm to worsen as the poem progresses then we've got this word floundering which usually denotes a sense of struggle so perhaps this is referring to the house itself and its unstable slash fragile position 
followed by black astride and blinding wet. Now, of course, this is uh, relating to the storm outside, all of the elements working together to create this terrifying atmosphere. It's almost as if the, the storm has enveloped the house. There's no escape. We've got that word astride there. It's the, the elements are covering the entire house. Things are only going to get worse. And another thing that you could explore are the sounds that Hughes chooses to use. We've got that fricative alliteration with the F sound, floundering, filled. It just sounds really unpleasant. And we've got the plosive Bs as well. Black, blinding, with the emphasis on that B sound. Of course, this is emphasizing the sheer power of the storm, but also the sounds are unbearable, almost painful to listen to. And then we've got the blinding wet. You've got that adjective blinding. It's difficult to see anything other than the destruction that is happening as a result of the storm. Then you've got this really effective use of enjambment after the blinding wet. So blinding wet continues on to the following line. There's this sense that the horror and destructive nature of the storm isn't going to stop anytime soon. So moving on to stanza one, we've got this time marker here. And I think this stanza is really, really interesting for several reasons. So this time marker, we are almost lulled into a false sense of security. We are thinking, hmm, and indeed the speaker, is everything safe now? And of course, we've got the orange sky. So this color imagery, we've got the vibrant hues. It's soft, it's inviting, it's welcoming. But of course, it's anything but. Perhaps this is the storm I put here, beguiling the people in the house, manipulating them, trying to get them to believe that everything is okay. The hills had new places. So the sheer power of the wind has somehow distorted, destroyed the hills, destroyed the landscape. And we can really visualize debris strewn everywhere. There's a real sense of the utter devastation and destruction cause. Nothing is safe. The house isn't safe. The landscape isn't safe. And certainly the people inside that house are not safe. We've got a really interesting line that follows wind, wielded, blade light. We've got the alliteration there. So we can really sort of sense that harsh whipping sound coming from the wind. And an interesting verb choice um, in wielded. Perhaps this is suggesting or trying to create an image of this glow piercing through the clouds like a nice slicing into something. Whatever the case, it is certainly a threatening image. What follows is further use of color imagery, but also perhaps this is a metaphor for an eye, maybe the eye of the storm. Are we dealing with some malevolent force here? Something almost supernatural? Is this thing, this being, this entity watching, waiting, getting ready to unleash its fury once again. Then stanza two ends with another striking, unusual simile. And this very much creates a sense of chaos, disorder and destruction, like the lens of a mad eye. This storm is completely unpredictable. This storm is far from over and it's certainly not going to hold back. Now, stanza three opens with a very interesting verb, scaled. What do you think of when you hear that verb, scaled? Okay, certainly an interesting verb choice. Uh, here we've got the speaker braving the storm. He has decided to get call from the call house. Uh, we assume to keep the fire going. Of course, this is very much emphasizing how dangerous the storm is and how dangerous it is to be outside braving the elements. Just going outside, just making that journey requires an immense effort. It again brings the power of the wind to the forefront again. And it's almost like the speaker at this point is having to scale a mountain. He's clinging on for dear life. Then line three 
through the brunt wind that dented the balls of my eyes. So a very powerful verb, dented, uh, a hyperbolic image, I guess. But now the wind has intensified, okay? It's now causing physical harm, discomfort. And this is something that you would want to mention to get those marks for structure. And perhaps you could discuss the theme of mankind versus the natural world at this point. The tent of the hills drummed and strained its guy rope. So another striking metaphor here, likening the hills to man-made structures or tents. They are weak, flimsy and vulnerable and certainly no match for the unrelenting wind. At this point, the wind has the power or even has distorted, destroyed parts of the landscape. Moving on to stanza four, We've got lots of personification here. So the fields are quivering. We've got that verb quivering. He's, well, Hugh, sorry, is very much personifying the landscape. It's in total fear. It's almost as if it's been tortured. And even the skyline is grimacing. So it's it's making this sort of ugly, contorted, twisted expression. There's almost this sense of pain. So even the fields, the sky, the landscape, nothing is safe. At any second to bang and vanish with a flap. These onomatopoeic words here, or monosyllabic words. The landscape is in this very futile and hopeless position. It cannot do anything. There's this sense that the inevitable is going to happen. And I guess that is complete destruction to, to the point where it cannot recover. Moving on, we've got some very vivid, jarring, almost grotesque imagery. The wind flung a magpie away and a black back gull bent like an iron bar slowly. Again, you've got those plosive bees. Black back gull bent bar. It's almost uncomfortable to say. Those violent verbs flung and bent. You've got this very unusual simile. It's very harrowing. It's very graphic. And notice, stanza four, the wind as expected has intensified and now it's moved on to taking lives. Who is next? Hmm, I wonder. And also notice that adverb slowly. This is not a quick death. It's slow. It's barbaric. There's, again, linking back to what we said earlier on, it's like the storm is putting on this very macabre, this wicked, this sinister show. It's absolutely terrifying. Then we've got the house with this really effective use of enjambment again. We can, as a reader, predict exactly what is going to happen next. And of course, the house is at the forefront here. The house is the focus. The storm is ready to move on to its next victim. And that, of course, is the house and the people inside. So absolutely terrifying at this point. So the house rang like some fine green goblet in the note that any second would shatter it. So we've got another striking simile here. Of course, emphasizing the fragility of the house. This time it's a bit more ex explicit and referring to the right singing note having the power to shatter it at any moment. Now deep in chairs in front of the great fire we grip our hearts and cannot entertain book, thought or each other. This is where it gets really juicy guys. Lots to one pick here as I've put here. First of all, notice how there is a switch to present tense, creating a real sense of immediacy. Of course, as readers, we are thinking, gosh, what is going to happen to the people inside the house? What are they going to do? How are they going to save their lives? Um, perhaps we are expecting this really heart-wrenching moment. They're going to turn to each other for comfort, for solace. Of course, there's this great fire that has been lit. This perhaps connotes a sense of warmth and comfort. However, this scene sets us up for another central theme, and that's internal 
conflict. The people in this poem cannot distract themselves. They can't read. They can't speak to each other. They can't reason. They can't think about what to do next. And they cannot stand each other. What is going on? So here is the unexpected turn that I guess we've been waiting for. And lots of students neglect this part. or well, they don't comment on it. And it's really, really key to the poem. Tension has been mounting throughout this poem. And this is almost the climax, if you like. The tension or internal conflict between the people inside the turbulence very much matches or mirrors the storm and turbulence outside. And perhaps this would be the perfect opportunity to liken the storm or explore the storm as a metaphor for their broken down relationship. So in the penultimate stanza, we've got an image of a great fire. Now the fire is blazing and the connotations or symbolic meaning perhaps becomes a little bit clearer. Is it in actual fact representing danger, destruction of their relationship, rather than connoting a sense of warmth, comfort, etc.? And feel the roots of the house move. Maybe this is again another metaphor on an explicit layer. Of course, this is referring to the foundations of the house shaking. It hasn't got much time left before, I guess it's reduced to a pile of rubble. But peeling back those layers, is this a metaphor for the demise of their relationship? There's no coming back from whatever conflict has been going on. But sit on. Why are they being so passive? Why are these people not discussing what to do next, what steps they need to take. Have they given up? Have they decided on their own fate? Which I guess is death. Pretty bleak. Seeing the window tremble to come in some more brilliant personification. You've got that verb tremble. Even the windows are fearful at this point. They know soon that the wind will shatter them. It's only a matter of time. And the last line, bleak as you would expect hearing the stones cry out under the horizons okay there's this real sense of desperation no hope for anyone or anything is this the end i think so and there you have it guys a full rundown of ted hughes's poem wind do let me know if you want more lit content and let me know in the comments below what is your favorite ted hughes poem until next time Bye bye. Oh, and don't forget to like, subscribe, turn the bell icon on and all of that. See you.